Thank you, Lord. We're going to continue our study on wisdom. We all need wisdom, and there are two kinds of wisdom. Wisdom of the world, which we saw in James chapter 1, and the wisdom from God. So this morning, let's start first by making a confession. And we're basing our confession on Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 and 3. So if you'll repeat after me, please. And the Spirit of the Lord Lord rests upon me, me. the Spirit of wisdom wisdom. and understanding, understanding. the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of of knowledge knowledge. and of the fear of the Lord. And the wisdom of God God makes me of quick understanding understanding. in the fear of the Lord. And I do not judge after the sight of my eyes or by what I hear, but with righteousness. Hallelujah. How many believe that? Amen. We have the spirit of wisdom. We have the spirit of understanding. We have the spirit of revelation knowledge. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit. Now, knowledge we saw before is knowing something or having knowledge of something. And I have said, you know, I have the knowledge of a computer. I know to turn it on. I know the keyboard is to type things in. And I know the mouse is to click and go where I want to. And that's about the limit of my understanding. Now, other people, that's my knowledge. Other people have an understanding of the computer. They understand how it works. They understand... Um, I don't know, David was talking one day, wanting to know, somebody came to fix our computer, and he said to him, are they still using, and if I say any terms wrong, you can correct me, are they still using the binary code? And, And they go, yes. Now, David was in computers in another generation. And, and when, when he was doing it, they would have to, um, literally take the wires and wire these things. But back then they were using it. Now, that didn't mean a thing to me. So then I asked him, what is it? He told me it still meant nothing to me. You see, I had no understanding. I have knowledge of a computer and what it will do for me, but I have no understanding. You see, it's necessary for us to get understanding. We can have all the knowledge possible of the Word of God. We can quote it. We can speak it. We can say it. But unless we have an understanding of how it works, it will not do us any good. But then you couple that with wisdom. You now understand it, but you need the wisdom to apply that understanding. You need wisdom to apply your understanding of the knowledge that you have. And we have had a lot of help in misunderstanding the word of God through doctrines and traditions of man. So we're, we're wanting to get... And receive from God the wisdom, his wisdom, how to get the knowledge of the word and the understanding. And we need that for the Holy Spirit. Understanding is revelation knowledge. And the Holy Spirit gives that to us, but then we need wisdom. And how to apply that to our daily life. There isn't a situation that we're going to come across in this lifetime of ours. That is not answered in the word of God. That God does not have the wisdom for. Everything is there. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Hallelujah. You know, I like the idea of never having to make a mistake. Being successful in everything I do. We've lived a bit longer than than some of the people here. A bit longer than, than the twins. They're three, so we've been here a bit longer than them. But we've made some mistakes. And if we had taken the time to find out what our Heavenly Father had to say about it, we wouldn't have had to make those mistakes. You see, he knows the end from the beginning. He created us. We are his workmanship. He knows better than I know what I should be doing down the road. He knows what I'm going to come up against, and he knows whatever wall I'm going to hit. And he's already got the wisdom for me. He's already got the way of getting out of that situation. Too often we come against the wall and then we panic. 
And then we start checking our mind. Like I said, we call it, it's like the file cabinet. You're missing a paper and you go through your files and it's not there. So you go through backwards. Then you take everyone out looking for it. It's not in there. Let me tell you, the answers are not in your mind. The world cannot tell us how to solve the problems in life, but God can. And if we go to the world to get their answers, we're just going to go in a dead, dead end road. Down the way, we'll have another problem. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 1. Hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake not my law. The law there is my instructions. Me telling you what to do. It's not the Ten Commandments. It's God's way of doing things. For I was, and, and when you see this as a father, look at it as our Heavenly Father. For I was my father's son, tender, and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me, Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. If we want to live the life abundant that God has gotten for us through Jesus, we've got to do it his way. As much as we don't like that because of the pride of man, which is what brought the fall about, we have to admit, I cannot do it on my own. I've got to follow God's plan. I've got to do it God's way if I want God's blessing. If I want to walk above the economic situation in this world, walk above the pestilence and disease, I'm going to have to do it God's way. Now he's telling us something here in verse 5. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. We all want wisdom. We want understanding. Oh, God, give me wisdom. Oh, God, give me understanding. It doesn't say pray and ask God for wisdom and understanding. It says get it. Get it. That is an action word. Get it. Go get it. Now, if he's telling us to get wisdom and he's telling us to get understanding, that means it's there. He has it for us. It's available to us. Amen? Amen. Forsake her not. Forsake who? Wisdom and understanding. And she shall preserve thee. Love her and she shall keep thee. Now we have seen who is wisdom. Do we remember? Who's wisdom? Jesus. Jesus is the wisdom of God. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Jesus are hid all the treasures. And we have studied that before. Verse 7. Well, verse 6. If you want to be preserved, you have to love wisdom. If you want to be kept, wisdom. Verse 7. Wisdom is the principal thing. Principle means the most important, the first thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understander. Exalt wisdom. Exalt Jesus, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. Verse 9. She, wisdom, Jesus, shall give to thy head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. But we're to receive that wisdom by faith. And we saw in James chapter 1, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. So we've got to do some asking. We've got to get it. You know, we've got to get to the place where we are teachable. Too often we reject the wisdom of God because we're not teachable. And when we reject the wisdom of God, the wisdom of God is light. The light of God. When we reject the wisdom of God, we are now walking in darkness. Because you're rejecting the light. There's no in between. It's either light or dark. It's either God or... Or it's the devil. And I've said this probably every Sunday. We've taught on wisdom and many that we didn't teach on wisdom. You get every thought from one of two sources. You either get your thoughts from God or you get your thoughts from the devil. There is no third. People say, well, that's just my thought. It is your thought, but you got it from somewhere. It came from somewhere. 
And if you take that thought, you can trace it whether the origin of that thought was God or the devil. There's only two sources of thoughts. There is no third source. We are the deciding witness. And I make a decision if I'm going to go with God's thoughts or the devil's thoughts. I'm the deciding witness in my life. People say, well, I couldn't help. You wouldn't understand. They made me do this. No, they didn't. You chose to give in to the pressure of them doing it because you didn't get the wisdom of God, didn't believe in the protection of God. Like Jesus did, you didn't walk in love and you could have walked right through the midst of the whole thing. And that's the place we want to get to. Amen? Hallelujah. Another thing that will stop the wisdom of God just like that in your life is talking unbelief. What is coming out of our mouth? Are they words of edification? Are they words according to God's word? We can't go around gossiping. We can't go around talking doubt and unbelief and expect the wisdom of God to flow. Unbelief, talking contrary to the word of God or opposite to the word of God puts us on the path of darkness. Immediately. Well, there's no no light in unbelief. As I said, you're speaking God's words or the devil's words. So judge. Am I speaking what God's saying or am I speaking what the devil's going to say? If I speak what he's saying, I'm going to be in darkness and I will not be able to operate in the wisdom of God. Let's look at Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 8. Ecclesiastes, right after Proverbs. Ecclesiastes 8. Verse 4. Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel or know no evil thing. And a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Who's the king they're talking about? Jesus. Jesus. Where the word of Jesus is, there is power. And who can say to Jesus, what are you doing? I don't need to do that. You might be saying that, but I don't need that. Who keeps the word of God? And we already saw that in Proverbs 4, keeping the commandments. Who keeps what Jesus says? We will know no evil. We will experience no evil. Because then you're a wise man and your heart discerns both time and judgment. We can't be talking opposite to the wisdom of God and expect it to work in our life. We can't reject Jesus' sayings and expect to have no evil happening in our life. One follows the other. I have the New Living Translation here. Um, Ecclesiastes 8.4. His command is backed by great power. This is talking about, well, don't try to avoid doing your duty and don't stand with those who plot evil. Who are we running with? For the king can do whatever he wants. His command is backed by great power. Jesus' command, Jesus' way of doing things is backed by great power. No one can resist or question it. Let's not argue with Jesus. It's amazing the number of people that argue with the word. Argue about what Jesus is telling us to do. Those who obey him will not be punished. Those who are wise will find a time and a way to do what is right. For there is a time and a way for everything, even when a person is in trouble. The wise, there's a time for everything. Have you ever noticed wise people know when to speak and when not to? A lot of times, the mouth of the fool will get him into trouble. If they had kept their mouth shut, they wouldn't have gotten into the trouble they were in. It's self-inflicted trouble. It's as if we keep our mouth shut and don't, and don't talk about everything we know. Nobody will even know that we're a fool. We'll fool them all. But the minute we open our mouth, they'll know whether we're wise or whether we are a fool. 
you know, the people just like to talk and talk and talk and talk. And it's all about me, myself, and I. And when you try and tell them something right away, me, myself, and I, I like what uh, Terry Copeland Pearson calls that. Me, myself, and I. She calls that the unholy trinity. (laughs) And I had to think about that when I first heard it, and I thought, oh, my, it definitely is, isn't it? Too often we've got me, myself, and I on my mind. I've got my rights. I've got my way. I'm smart. I can do it how I want, when I want, and if I want. And then we end up in trouble and we blame God or our parents or our who government. Let's look at Psalm 111. A wise person will never speak against their government. I hear people praying for their government and then go and tear them down with their words. Don't do it. We have a righteous nation. Amen? Amen? So we're talking about wisdom. We're going to go again to the beginning of wisdom, getting wisdom, how to get wisdom, being wise, getting it. Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endures forever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Number one, accepting God, knowing there is a God, the God above all gods. Making Jesus Christ the Lord of our life. There is no wisdom outside Jesus. And if we do not believe in our heart, confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, we have no wisdom. Because we don't have Jesus. So we have zero wisdom. So that's why the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. The honor of God. Fear means to reverence and honor. It doesn't mean to stand there trembling because we don't know when he's going to smack us upside the head. That's what religion has taught us. God is not like that. He's a God of love. He does everything he can to draw us in and to lead us and guide us. The Lord is my shepherd. He wants to lead and guide and direct me. The amount of esteem or value we place on the word of God is the amount of wisdom we will get out of it. God is honored when our decisions and actions are solely based on his word. To honor someone, we delegate authority to that person. Psalm 10.4. We're going to sort of look at wise and foolish so we can see the difference. It's easy to say, well, I know foolish. Um... In the Greek, it talked about the foolish man, and foolish comes from the Greek word moros, which means stupid or a moron. And I know there's none of us there, here that are like that, so none of us are foolish. Verse 10, chap, no, pardon me, Psalm 10, verse 4. The wicked, through pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in his thoughts. God calls that wicked because we think it's pride God resists the proud. But what? I don't need to read that Bible. What do you mean I, God's got a plan for me? I'm going to do what I want, when I want, how I want. God is not in my thoughts. That is being a fool. All day long you go about your life making your own decisions, never thinking about God, never thinking about his word. There is a day of reckoning. There is always a day of reckoning. Not that God zaps us, but we will eat the fruit of our labors. And if they're wrong, we will eat whatever wrong there is. So the fool says, there's no God. It was interesting. David was speaking to somebody this week. And, and somebody else said to him, do you believe in God? And the, he said, no. And the fellow that asked him was a Muslim. And the Muslim said, then you're an idiot. And, and, and he says, how can you look outside and not know there's a God, etc.? This person became so offended that he was told that, that he believed there is no God, that, that he was then an idiot. You see, he doesn't have anything. But yet, he said, now get this, he doesn't believe there's a God. Yet later, he said to David, he said, um, Anyway, I know I'm, going to, I'm not going to hell. 
Well, how do you know you're not going to hell? Because I'm a good guy. I do think good things. Now, if he doesn't believe in God, why should he be concerned about hell? Go figure. So everybody knows there is a God. They know it. Just because God put that in us, people know there is a God. And then people say, well, I know there's a God. And I know he created everything. And I'm going to serve him however I want to. Wrong. He said how to do it. He's God. He's God. He is God. And we honor him by letting his word carry weight in our life. We want to be prosperous. We want to be healthy. We want to have good success. And yet we're going to do it our way. And then say, God, this is what I've done now. How come you're not blessing me? He says, well, I never told you to do that. Well, I wanted to. So what? I never told you to do that. He doesn't bless us just because we want him to bless us when we're doing whatever we want to do. Get the wisdom of God and it'll already be blessed. Amen? There is, um, people think today that God's word is archaic. It's not for today. It's not for that now generation. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word was good yesterday, it's good today, and it'll be good for our life forever. There will be no change in his word. And we saw in Proverbs 14 that it says there is a way. Man has a way. It seems right, but it will end in death. The death of a promise, the death of a plan, a death of a dream. Our way will end in death. We saw last week a spiritual principle. You become what you behold. You become what you behold. Whatever you put your eyes on and your ears on, you will become. That's a spiritual principle. And you don't realize it. But it, ha- it, it, it doesn't just happen. It gets more and more and more. And we're unaware of it even happening. We've all heard about the frog that was put in a pot of water. It was just nice water. His kind of temperature water. And this pot was put on a fire. And that frog just sat in there happy as could be. They might have fed him some bugs and he just stayed in that pot. And the water got warmer and warmer and warmer. And he just stayed in there, never jumped out. Because he became accustomed to what he was around. Until eventually it got so hot it cooked him. And they had frog soup. We become what we behold. We can be in a situation, and when we first hear it, we go, ooh, that's not good. But you stay in it. Ooh. But the longer you stay with it, the more you will become like what you've stayed in. You'll be like that frog, and by the end, you'll be cooked. Your dreams will be dashed to pieces. Praise God for the grace. That the Holy Spirit's always working and drawing, working and drawing. Praise God for the blood, for forgiveness. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But let's find out about this before we get in the pot. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We take on what we're rooted in. And we can tell what we're rooted in by the fruit in our life. We can see because, of course, the nourishment comes through the roots up through the tree, through the branches, and it bears, shows the fruit. Somebody sent me an email. They had seen somebody say, if you don't like your fruit, check your roots. Whatever we're rooted in is what kind of fruit we'll bear. We have to say, do I like my life? Do I like what I speak? Do I like what I see? Do I like how I act? If not, get your roots plucked up. With the word of God, by faith, and plant them into what God tells you to plant them in. And your fruit will change. Your life will change. Your actions will change. Your vocabulary will change. Your thinking will change. Your friends will change. Your attitude will change. And your attitude will determine your altitude. Amen? We saw how Satan deceived Eve in the garden 
Then after they sinned, they said, we realize we're naked. And what that was, the glory of God left them and they were on their own. So they went and got fig leaves and sewed fig leaves together to try and cover themselves. Fig leaf. Religion. Do it ourself. I've got a problem and I'm going to try and solve it myself. So you have all these various religions out there. And they're all, if people don't believe in God or don't think Jesus, why are they all worshipping these idols and all kinds of strange things? Adam and Eve decided to solve a spiritual problem with a natural thing. Too often we try and solve our problems which are spiritually based. Because everything in the natural was created by the spirit. We see that in Genesis. And we try and solve the problem the way Adam and Eve did in man's thinking. And it didn't work. So God killed some animals and clothed them with the animal skins. And made a blood covenant with them. Showing Jesus who would shed his blood for us. Remember the parable where um, Jesus went to Mary and Martha's house. And Martha was so busy doing what she thought would please Jesus. Working, cleaning, cooking. Mary sat at Jesus' feet. Martha came and said, Master, can't you just see her standing in front of Jesus, interrupting him. Master, don't you realize that that sister of mine has left me alone to clean and cook? Tell her to get up, get up and get at it and help me. Jesus said, now she was sitting at wisdom's feet. Mary has chosen the good part and that won't be taken away from her. Why? She was sitting at the feet of wisdom, getting wisdom so she could walk out life when Jesus was gone. She was getting the wisdom of God. And when we get the wisdom of God sitting at Jesus' feet, that wisdom will not be taken away from us. It cannot be plucked out of us. It cannot be taken away from us. What are you hanging around? Let's look at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Verse 7, you see, Peter and James and John, they were fishermen. They were unlearned men. They were fishermen. And in verse 7, it says, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked Peter and the disciple, by what power or by what name have you done this? They, the man by the gate beautiful was healed. How have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means is he made whole, be it known unto all you and to the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even By his doth this man stand before you. Peter, a fisherman, they took note. In another chapter it says, they took note that he was an unlearned man, but had been hanging around Jesus. He went from denying Jesus three times, being a wimp and a coward, to standing up, being the first person to preach the gospel, and 3,000 got saved. By power of the Holy Ghost. Because he sat with Jesus. You see, what you hang around, you become. Judas hung around the greedy people. He was stealing. He was hanging around the wrong crowd. And he sold Jesus. And he ended up hanging himself. That's his epitaph. He hung himself. Peter, on the other hand, has a completely different testimony because he hung around Jesus. He was sincere in what he was doing. He hung around wisdom. 
You want to be wise? You want to become wise? Hang around those that are wise. You want to be a faith giant? Spend time with people that are in faith. Don't hang around doubt and unbelief. It'll pull you down all the time. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Looking at the difference. So now, it, 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 as we study this, it's going to be easy for us to go, Whoa, that's a fool. Whoa, that one's wise. I'm going to hang around that. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed, empowered to prosper. And the blessing is, we saw on Wednesday, walking in our dominion and authority. Is the man that endures temptation. So there is a temptation out there. But you endure it. You don't give in to it. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Mark this down. Get it ingrained in your heart and in your thinking. No temptation comes from God. Everybody say it. I am not tempted by God. That is so important because I keep hearing people say, well, God knows I'm able, so he just puts it all on me. It says, let no man say he is tempted of God. No man. Verse 13. Uh, 14, pardon me. But every man is tempted. When is a person tempted? When he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Because of what you hang around, because of what you see, you develop an inordinate desire for something. And then once that is, it says, then when lust, that inordinate desire, has conceived, it brings forth sin. You will do what you look at. Always. Your eyes, your ears, your heart, you do. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Walking in the wisdom of the world will bring death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Is cancer a good gift? It's not from God. Is poverty a good gift? It's not from God. Anything that isn't good is not from God. And he tempts no man. None. Zero. No. He was tempted so we don't have to be. But he was tempted not by God. God didn't tempt him. Yeah. But we, we too are tempted. But we don't give in. Because it says when we enter tests and trials before that, there is that temptation. Now, it says, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Let's look at the reverse. Now, that's walking as a fool. Let's look at the reverse, what a wise would do. When the desire of God is conceived, it brings forth faith. And when faith is finished, it brings forth life. What's on our eyes, our ears, and in our mouth? What are we looking at? Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1. going to again look at some scriptures comparing the two and I'm going to read this one out of the New Living Translation Proverbs 1 7 fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge and we saw that in in Psalm 111 
But fools despise wisdom and discipline. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. So a wise man wants to hear instruction and learn. So when you, you, you can tell by looking at somebody, are they open to instruction? Do they want to learn? They're wise. If they start saying, yeah, well, I know that, but you don't understand, I was the rejecting instruction that says here, fools despise wisdom and discipline. Verse 23 Come and listen to my counsel. I'll share my heart with you and make you wise. This is Jesus talking. Do we want wisdom? The mature will follow God and change. If we want wisdom, we need to be open to rebuke and to being reproved. Correction. You know, we all need correction. There is not one of us that knows everything Not one of us are walking 100% perfect all the time. We all need correction. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. Somehow we, we get the idea when we're corrected, it's like, oh no, God doesn't love me. Look at, he's not happy with me. And then we think God corrects through sickness and disease. And we found out already that's not right. So we're going to look at this here, Proverbs, Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, again, I'm going to read out of the living, New Living. Hebrews 12, 5. And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't give up when he corrects you, for the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as a child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are not legitimate and that you are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? And in, in Hebrews, it talks about how, the, and there, the fathers of our flesh disciplined us. So they disciplined us in the flesh, but God is the father of spirits, and he disciplines us in our spirit. Let's look at, so we see their love corrects. Let's look at 2 Timothy to see how he does this. Chapter 3, 2 Timothy 3, here's how God corrects. Verse 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to, To make thee wise, notice again, it's the word of God that makes us wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. All scripture, all scripture, all scripture, the Bible, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. How does God correct us? He sends, he sent his word, we read it ourselves. But if we're doing something wrong, because we haven't got wisdom or knowledge of the word, and we're doing something wrong, how can we correct ourselves? We can't. And thus, the body of Christ. He said in the church, gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Teachers, pastors. So we can give the word that the God gives us so you can be corrected. So you can grow in the word. He's given us the body. You know, we get offended with people. And I've heard so many people say, well, I got hurt in that church. And I'm not going to go to church anymore because I got hurt. Jesus is the head. The head. 
and everything flows from the head. The hand is connected to the head by the wrist and the arm. So the hand gets mad at the wrist. Wrist, I've had it with you. I am not going to fellowship with you anymore. I am not going to talk to you anymore. I am cutting myself off from you. And what's going to happen to the hand when the hand cuts itself off from the wrist? It is now cut off from the body of Christ. Why? Strife. And that's why Satan so wants to get the people of God into offense, being offended, so he can steal the word out of them and cut them off, and they no longer can flow. They're no longer being fed. We've all been hurt. Somebody said something to every one of us. It just happens. I've, I've hurt people. And I think back, did I hurt this person? Did I do that? And you know, I honestly search my heart and I think, I didn't mean to hurt that person. I really, my heart's desire was to help them. People don't want to hurt people. The reason people hurt people is because they're hurting themselves. They are so wound up in themselves and how they hurt and how people have hurt me that somehow they've just been in hurt so long you become what you stay in and the only thing you know is to hurt so when we cut ourselves off we will die and I've seen people that love the Lord in the word and spirit filled get offended God didn't do something for me I asked God to do this he didn't do it Or this person said that. And they've cut themselves off. And you know what? To listen to them, they still believe God. They still love God. But their doctrine is so squirrely. They say, well, I know the Bible says that, but I've got my own ideas about that. I've got my own ideas about healing. I've got my own ideas about prosperity. And Satan is leading them around. I don't know if any of you, I remember going out to my grandmother's farm. And if there was a bull out there that was really nasty, they would have a ring through its nose. And all the, they, if they didn't have a rope to hook in, but all this bull that could trample anybody, just stick their finger through this ring in his nose and just lead him along like a little puppy. He would not do a thing. That bull didn't know. That he had all power and all authority. And when we get cut off, we've allowed Satan to put a ring in our nose. And we've got the dominion. And we've got the authority. And he puts his finger in that ring and he's just leading us around. Through all kinds of hell and craziness. Because we've cut ourselves off from the body. Because we won't allow somebody to correct us. We won't allow somebody to encourage us. We won't take the discipline of the Lord. What, you trying to tell me I'm not right? You trying to tell me I made a mistake? What, you trying to tell me? And Satan is just keeps pulling that ring. And we're just following him. And not realizing anymore that we have been given dominion and authority to speak to that low-level devil. Speak to him because he's been defeated by Jesus. Jesus shed his blood so we can have victory. And we're being led around, refusing the wisdom of God and making crazy decisions. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God uses his word to correct. Proverbs 9, 8. Proverbs 9, 8. I'm going to read a few more scriptures here. Proverbs 9, 8. Proverbs 9, 8. Here's a, a, an admonition to us, and I'm sure we've all found this out. Don't bother correcting mockers or fools. They will only hate you. But correct the wise, and they will love you. 
How many have tried to correct a fool and they just get all puffed up and just end up, just, they do almost hate you. But it, so you can tell the difference. When you try to correct somebody, if they get all puffed up and mad, they're a fool. If they receive the correction, they're wise. Proverbs 13, 18. If you ignore criticism, you will end in poverty and disgrace. If you accept correction, you will be honored. If you do not accept instruction and correction, you will end in poverty. It doesn't matter how much seed you have planted. Because with the planting of seed is God's direction in how to do it. You can write, if you're taking notes, write these scriptures down. Proverbs 15.5. Proverbs uh, 15.5 and verses 10 to 12, verses 31 to 33. Talks about rejecting instruction. And again, that's how you can recognize a fool when they reject instruction. Proverbs 18, 7. The mouths, and we have studied so much about confession, but the mouths of fools are their ruin. They trap themselves with their lips. How many people know people, they just burst everything out, and they get themselves into trouble because they don't shut up. I know that was probably not a nice way to put it, but all they think about is me, myself, and I, as I said, the unholy trinity. And there's, I'll give you some more scriptures on that. Proverbs 10, 19, Proverbs 17, 27 to 28, and Proverbs 29, 11. We'll look at 29, 11. Fools vent their anger. If somebody's always angry, yelling, screaming, having a fit, you're a fool. But the wise quietly hold it back. Again, you can tell who's wise and who's a fool. Now, this isn't, you know, this isn't a condemnation thing. This is an instruction. So you look at this and you think, ah, oh, I have a problem with anger. Therefore, I am a fool. Now, I'm going to have to correct myself. Holy Spirit, show me what to do to not walk in anger. You get correction. You don't throw your hands up and say, well, I guess I'm a fool. And go out there and lose your temper. And keep perpetuating it because eventually it'll get you in big trouble. You lose your temper, you will get into big trouble somewhere along the line. So there again, you can see who's a fool, and what's a fool, and what isn't. Proverbs 13. And we'll end here today. Proverbs 13. Verse 1. So parents, you can tell if your children are wise. A wise child accepts a parent's discipline. But we're all children of someone. We have spiritual parents, and we accept their discipline as well. A mocker refuses to listen to correction. Again, somebody refuses to listen to correction, they're a mocker. I don't know. I've talked to people, and, and they go, whatever, this and this and this. And you try and tell them, they come to you with the problem, whatever, I need help. This is the situation. And so then you tell them, like you, you give them the word, but they refuse to listen. They go on to another subject. They change the subject because they don't want to hear the correction. Wise words will win you a good meal, but treacherous people have an appetite for violence. A fool and wise. Those who control their tongue will have a long life. 
opening your mouth can ruin everything. Well, so much we know. We will watch our words. Now we know why King David said, Set a watch over my lips, O Lord, that I sin not against your word. We sin with our mouth. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to say hallelujah, but that's not a good place to say hallelujah. <laughs> However, praise the Lord, hallelujah, we've got the answer. The word, the name of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Is he good? Is he good? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. He's given us his word so we can walk in wisdom. Amen. He's given us teachers we can learn and understand. He's given us people in the body of Christ that love us. Now, we don't go around just correcting everybody. Going and saying, you know, David, you've got a problem. Well, you don't, but anyway. <laughs> With the way you tie your tie. It's, if there's, probably Ben's the only one that can correct him on how to tie a tie. Ben looks after Dave. Ben really looks after Pastor David very well, so he can correct him. That's not the type of correction we're talking about. We correct with the word of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. 